Good morning, everybody. My name is Alex, and welcome to part two of my broad argument against the existence of objective morality. In my last video, linked below, I discussed why I think that religious morality, even if God exists, is still subjective, and in this video, I'll be explaining why I think that Sam Harris's atheistic case for objective morality is also actually subjective. However, and rather crucially, it was in that last video that I began by defining what I mean by morality, so you'll probably want to watch at least that first part before beginning this video, since it's an essential part of the discussion. But assuming you have, let's get going. If you're wondering why this matters, why we should care if morality is objective or not, then consider the implications of the existence of objective morality. For one thing, it would mean that we could dictate how other people should behave without being accused of bias or cultural imperialism. This is one of the reasons Sam Harris was so eager to make his case. We can tell people that it's objectively morally wrong to force a child to marry, or to force a woman into a burqa, or to throw gay people from a rooftop. But as well as this, objective morality would also allow us to escape nihilism because we'd be able to point to objective values and make the case that we can use these to determine our purpose, whatever that means. So this is really a crucial discussion. So like I say, one of the most famous attempts among atheists, of course, to demonstrate that morality can be objective, comes from Sam Harris in The Moral Landscape. And I wouldn't actually be surprised if a majority of atheists believe morality to be objective, simply based on his incredible influence. But for me, the basis that Harris constructs for an objective morality falls apart for a similar reason as religious morality does, and the flaws that I see in Harris's particular case can be applied, as far as I can see, to any attempt to define morality in an objective sense by assigning some naturalistic synonyms to concepts like good, bad, or ought. Now, interestingly, I'd love for Harris to be right. I really would, because of the benefits of objective morality that I just outlined. But if I want to be really philosophically satisfied, I have to be intellectually honest. And when it comes to Harris's morality, I just don't buy it. So my ultimate criticism of Harris's moral theory is practically the same as the criticism I levied in my last video against religious morality. It claims to be objective, but is in fact ultimately based in subjectivity. Harris proposes a naturalistic definition of morality, meaning that he thinks that moral truths can be derived from the observable empirical world. Harris claims that you can derive an ought from an is, that is, you can find out how you should behave based upon observable facts about the universe. This is called ethical naturalism and contrasts David Hume's assertion that you can't derive an ought from an is. Hume thought that the two occupied different logical spheres. Now, Harris fairly recently displayed his reasoning for this view that morality can be objective in a Twitter thread, which I'll link below, and I think I can pinpoint the moment at which I feel subjective assumptions enter his thinking. Of course, I implore you to read the whole thing, but here are the real offenders. Sam says this, among the myriad of things that exist are conscious minds, susceptible to a vast range of actual and possible experiences. Unfortunately, many experiences suck, and they don't just suck as a matter of cultural convention or personal bias, they really and truly suck. If you doubt this, place your hand on a hot stove and report back. Later, he says, if we should do anything in this life, then we should avoid what really and truly sucks. If you consider this question begging, consult your stove as above. Well, I'm afraid I still consider it to be question begging, because all you prove by pointing out that nobody wants to put their hand on a stove is that everybody agrees that their well-being, things that don't suck, is good. But Harris makes the fatal conflation here between the objective fact that everyone agrees that X is true and the objective fact that X is objectively true. Just because we all subjectively react badly to pain and suffering doesn't make pain and suffering objectively bad. Truth is not the same thing as democracy or consensus. If you don't see what I'm saying, consider the following example. Imagine yourself and a roommate need to paint the walls of a shared living room, and you're trying to determine a color in which to do it. Now, just imagine for a second that you both happened to, entirely subjectively, think that blue is the best color to paint the walls of any room. It doesn't matter why you both think that blue is the best color, and you couldn't explain it if you tried. But the fact that you both subjectively do, 
means that you can treat blue as though it is objectively the best colour to paint a room. Of course, this is based entirely on your individual subjective hunches, but because they happen to agree, in practice this is as though it's an objective fact, and you can treat it as such. You can therefore get on with painting the wall. But the error is to suggest that because we can treat this as though it's objective, it actually is objective. Clearly, on a philosophical level, blue would not actually objectively become the best colour just because you both agree that it is subjectively. So imagine more radically that everybody in the world happened to subjectively agree that blue is the best colour. Would this make it objectively the best colour? Well, no, because there can't be an objectively best colour. For something to be objectively true, it means that that truth is in no way influenced by human opinion. So if that truth is a human opinion, it can't be objective. Now, we have to be very careful here, and I want to thank Stephen, Rationality Rules, for talking to me about this privately, because he's made me a lot more careful in how I put this. He still disagrees with me, but he's made me feel it necessary to clarify something. Take this example where every human being happens to subjectively agree that blue is the best colour. This is based in subjectivity. However, this isn't to say that it wouldn't be an objective fact that everybody prefers blue. That is indeed an objective fact about the state of every person's brain. You can say that objectively it is a fact that every person on earth thinks blue is as good as it gets, and also objectively that they all feel they ought to chase what's good. But there's a difference between saying that it's objectively true that we all think that blue is the best colour, and saying that it's objectively true that blue is the best colour. And I think this is where the confusion and objection tends to lie. The adherent of Harris's philosophy might say that by the word best, we simply mean most appropriate according to people's preferences. Therefore, if it's objectively true that we all agree that blue is our favourite colour, and best is whatever fits our preferences, it becomes objectively true that blue is the best colour. However, this is based on the assumption that best really does mean that which accords to preference, and if it does mean that, then surely that means that preference, which is subjectivity, lies at the heart of defining blue as best. Furthermore, even if we allow for that, with morality the analogous assumption would be that by good we mean that which accords to our preferences, i.e. our desire to avoid pain. But what's this assumption based on? If you need to define good in terms of avoiding pain in order to prove your conclusion, and your conclusion is that good is synonymous with the avoidance of pain, then you haven't made an argument at all. You've just redefined good, and incredibly unhelpfully. Let's put it another way. Consider the stove Harris referred to. Sure, you know for a fact, an objective fact, that it's painful to touch a stove. And it's also an objective fact that you subjectively consider that pain to be bad. And it's also an objective fact that you feel as though you ought to avoid that which is bad. So do I. So does everyone. That's what Sam Harris is saying. Since it's objectively true that we all experience pain as bad, if I can show that doing X brings about pain, I've proven that X is objectively bad. But just like with the colour blue, just because we all subjectively agree that pain is bad, it doesn't make it an objective truth that pain is bad, it just makes it a universal subjective truth that we all happen to agree with. In order to say that because we all experience pain as bad, avoiding pain is good, you have to presume that something can be defined as good or bad simply because we feel that it's good or bad, which is subjective. Or you have to just immediately assert that good is simply defined in accordance with the objectively measurable states of our minds, which is the very thing that you're trying to prove, which is circular. As you can see, just like with morality that's religious, we're left with an ethical system that's either subjective or circular and therefore invalid. I realise this is getting complicated and so I hope you can see what I'm saying. Let me know if you need me to break this down even more. It's just crucial to understand that I don't disagree with Harris that it is objectively true that we all experience pain as bad. I just think that this doesn't warrant us to define bad as that which brings about pain. But the thing is, even if we did this and Harris was right that some things can be objectively good or bad, it's still a subjective assumption that we ought to do that which is good and avoid that which is bad. This is an assumption Harris lays bare in that last tweet. 
Where Harris says here that we should avoid what sucks, that is, what's painful, he recognises that this is open to the charge of question begging, to which he responds by uncharacteristically missing the point and pointing back to the subjective feeling of pain that we feel when we touch a stove. This tweet says that if we should do anything, we should avoid pain, and we know this because we all feel that pain is bad. This clearly and plainly displays that his argument for objective morality is as follows. This is Sam Harris's argument for objective morality. We ought to avoid pain because we all feel that pain is bad. Can you not spot the assumptions in there? There are at least three. Firstly, consider that the tweet opens with, if we should do anything. Is that not precisely what he's trying to prove? That we can show that there are things that we should do? That's literally what he's trying to prove, that we can uncover shoulds. So him starting by saying, if we should do anything, well, who's to say that we should do anything? You can't just assume that there must be something that we should do in order to prove that we can show objectively that there are things we should do. That's absurdly circular and so uncharacteristic of Harris. As well as that, there's the assumption that because we all feel that pain is bad, that makes pain objectively bad, which assumes that consensus can determine objective truth. And finally, there's the assumption that we ought to avoid that which is bad, which may seem instinctively true, but can't be proven. That's something I discussed in the previous video. So of Sam Harris's argument for objective morality, not a modicum of any of the premises can be demonstrated to be objectively true. It's completely grounded in subjectivity and question begging. The idea that good or conceptions of duty have naturalistic synonyms always begs the questions, as it does with Harris's morality. Moore was right in saying that good is like the colour yellow. It's like I said in the last video. It has no synonyms. It can't be explained to someone who's never experienced it. It's worth noting that whilst I've looked here specifically at Sam Harris's morality, these criticisms apply to all naturalistic morality. If you try to assign some naturalistic synonym, by which I mean something that is observable and empirical, like pain or well-being or happiness, if you try to assign any naturalistic quality as a synonym for good or bad, you immediately open yourself up to a wealth of problems. Let's call this naturalistic property X. So for Sam Harris, X would be that which is conducive to well-being. You can always ask, but what makes X good? And that line of questioning never ends. What makes well-being good? Well, it makes us happier. Well, what makes happiness good? Well, it feels good. And why is feeling good objectively good? At some point, you just have to settle for, it's just good. And that's what Harris does with pain. It's just bad. You know it is. I know it is. You just, you just know it is because you feel that it is. Again, this isn't a problem. I just don't buy for a second the idea that this can be described as in any way objective. So I suppose this is now the time to explain why I think this doesn't have to be a problem. There is a saving grace. Think back to the example of the colour blue, for instance. This is helpful. If we all agreed that blue was the best colour, then, like I say, philosophically, it still wouldn't be an objective truth. But practically, we can treat it as though it were objective, since we all agree. For instance, in deciding which colour to paint a room, we could argue that it objectively is true that we should paint it blue, which is true in a practical sense, but just not on a philosophical level. That is to say, as long as we can find a point of subjective agreement, however we make that agreement, we can still make practical usage of ethical statements in terms like should or ought, as long as we bear in mind that they do have a little asterisk. For instance, where the entire world agrees that blue is the best colour, it is objectively true that if you buy a car, you should get a blue one. The asterisk is that you should get a blue car, provided we assume that you ought to do that which we subjectively consider to be good. If you do assume this, and so morality can function on a practical level, we can retain the idea of things like should. Still, it's completely based in subjectivity, but because we have that subjective agreement, we can treat it as though it's subjective, as long as we bear in mind that it's not, in order to be philosophically consistent. Let me explain this with an example. In the same clip of William Lane Craig that I played in the previous video, Craig goes on to suggest that if morality is subjective, this is a huge problem since, for instance, there would be no way to prove to a Nazi that the Holocaust was wrong. If Germany won World War II, it would have been good. 
Now, this is a common objection to subjective morality, but it's actually one that I can account for. It's worth noting, of course, though, that even if this were true, if, that if morality were subjective, there is no way to convince someone that the Holocaust was wrong. That would just be a harsh fact, not evidence that morality is objective. But luckily, I don't think it is necessarily true. So again, we have to be very careful here. I'm not claiming that it is objectively true that the Holocaust was wrong. Instead, I'm going to show that despite the fact that it isn't objectively wrong and can't be shown to be objectively wrong, we can still convince people subjectively that it was wrong using reason. This is because even if myself and a Nazi don't agree that the Holocaust was bad, there will always be something at some level that we subjectively do agree upon. And this is what Sam Harris alludes to in pointing out that we all experience pain as bad. For instance, suppose I meet a Nazi who thinks that the Holocaust was good. I naturally disagree. Now let's say that we discovered that we both subjectively agree that our own well-being is a good thing. This is a subjective feeling, entirely subjective, but one we agree on. Based on this, if I can convince the Nazi that the Holocaust harmed all of our well-being, and this Nazi believes that things that harm his well-being are bad, I would have logically convinced him that the Holocaust is bad, even though it's based on a subjective assumption, just because we both agree on that assumption. So if the Nazis had won World War II, and most people did believe that the Holocaust wasn't wrong, it would still be possible to say that those people are incorrect in their moral opinion, but with reference not to objective reality, but simply to their very own subjective core beliefs. If the ruling Nazis believed, say, in the smooth running of society, and so do I, subjectively, then the contention is no longer, was the Holocaust good? But instead, was the Holocaust conducive of a smoothly running society? If I can show that it wasn't, and that it harmed society, I could demonstrate that the moral opinion of the ruling Nazi party was wrong even if I can only do this on the basis of subjective notions. Again, so long as we agree on those subjective notions, we can treat morality as though it's objective. And it doesn't matter why we agree, it doesn't matter in practice that it's entirely subjective. Morality can still be discussed on a practical level by considering whether or not something logically contradicts our subjective impulses. This doesn't make morality objective, but it retains the ability to use words like should and ought, so long as we keep in mind that at a fundamental philosophical level, we're dealing in subjectivity. Unfortunately, of course, even with this, it still can't be proven that a certain thing is objectively good or bad. That is to say, despite it being possible to practically convince the entire world that the Holocaust was evil, this would still be subjective, and we still can't prove that it actually was objectively evil. But I hope I've shown that this doesn't need to be such a problem as many people make it out to be. So that's it. That's my problem with ethical naturalism, including Sam Harris's version, to round things off. So at this point, I hope to have explained what I think morality is, why I think it must ultimately be subjective whether or not God exists, and why this isn't necessarily a problem. That's it. Obviously, there are many avenues of this discussion that I haven't touched on, but I surely will in the future, and perhaps many of you in the comments will do the same. I'll also, as I've said, uh, soon be discussing whether all of this means we should all be nihilists, which a lot of people uh, think it logically does, which should be a fun discussion. But until then, I hope this has clarified my position, and as I've said before, my position is one that's always evolving, so let me know where you think I went wrong. This is my favourite philosophical discussion to have, and I'm incredibly lucky to have a platform on which to talk about it. So I really do hope that you've enjoyed this like I have. Uh, do let me know your thoughts in the comments. You can follow me on social media here. I want to thank you as always for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.